So getting right into it, here's a nice definition of what psychology exactly is. Psychology is the scientific study of the human mind and its functions, especially those functions affecting behaviour in a given context. Okay, so this last bit is, is a real important part to the definition of what psychology is. So especially those functions affecting behaviour in a given context. So that's the really important part. We're not just simply learning about what psychology is, but we're, we're really thinking at this level about its application. And sort of thinking along those lines of the application of psychology and why it's important is it's quite nice to think about these four important parts of what actually makes psychology psychology, okay? These sort of four aims, if you like, describe, explain, predict, and change is a nice way to think of, well, what actually is almost like the purpose of psychology. And these sort of four aims of what makes psychology psychology is kind of almost like where its beauty lies. So with psychology, you have the able to describe and tell us what occurs. So we're talking about, uh, in, in psychology context, sort of why people do the things they do. And importantly, uh, the first part in that process is being able to accurately describe what is going on, okay? So then that explained bit nicely, nicely sort of adds to, to what's going on and adds a why, okay? And so I, I suppose those sort of two aims are quite nice in, in sort of paint a picture of what psychology does, but these last two are really sort of where psychology comes to life. Doing the first two gives you the ability to predict and to change, okay? So predict, identify conditions under which a future behavior or mental, pro mental process is likely to occur. If you can predict, it, it gives you the ability to change, okay? Um, and apply psychological knowledge to prevent unwanted behavior and to bring about desired change, okay? For whatever reason that may be, there's, there's multiple reasons um, uh, and multiple interests, I should say. But that's certainly a nice way to think, if you were to describe what psychology is, to, to cover those four things. And talking about interests and change, um, this slide sort of nicely, nicely sort of gives you an idea of, of what exactly is psychology and how it plays out, um, almost like the landscape of psychology, if you like. Um, so talking about interests, that's that sort of table at the bottom of the, of the slide there. Just sort of key areas that psychology has, has really uh, grown and developed um, over, over the sort of the, the years. And I've, I've added these two, these two sort of Venn diagrams to almost sort of show the relationship between um, the two fields, if you like, in, in psychology. So you've got academia or academic psychology and you've got professional or the profession of psychology. In the, in the diagram there, you can see sort of the, the jobs that these sort of two lead to. Um, so on the academic side, you've got your scientists, your researchers, and on the professional side, you've got your, your doctors, your consultants, your therapists and counsellors. But the reason why these I've represented these two together in a diagram like that is just to show sort of the relationship of how psychology works. Because it's such a new science, the two are very um, interconnected, if you like. Uh, the relationships very much working um, and current because much of, uh, much of why we do the things we do is, is still unknown. So the, the practice and the profession is, is very, very heavily influenced still by the current academic findings. The emergence of psychology as a science goes across a huge span of time and I've broken it down into two parts because of this. Um, and the first part is, I think a nice way to think about it is, is philosophy, because that's certainly what became um, for psychology as a science, is the study of the human mind, but not in that scientific sense. It was far more in a philosophical sense. A good place to start is with uh, René Descartes, okay? So he's a French philosopher, and he essentially suggested that the mind and body are independent from each other. Okay, so a key, a key figure in the emergence of psychology as a science, but at this stage, 
just to make it clear, it was very much a philosophical pursuit, okay? Um, so this idea of uh, Cartesian dualism, okay, so the mind and body are independent from each other, and this famous quote, you might have came across it before, I think, therefore, I am, okay? The two sort of big schools that he, that he kind of worked in, if you like, um, and proposed was was the rationalist school of thought and the nativist school of thought. So we can start to think about science, psychology as a science. This is sort of the first signs where where we start to see to see it emerging, um, but certainly still a philosophy. And nativist hereditary provides individuals with inborn knowledge and abilities. We use this to reason. Okay, so we'll see that much further down the line when we come to the main approaches um, and certainly the biological approach. Another key figure in this philosophical stage um, of, of psychology is John Locke. The key idea that he proposed was empiricism and that idea is that all experience can be obtained through the senses and that human beings inherit neither knowledge nor instincts. So it's almost like a blank slate or a tabula rasa. And this view would basically form the basis of the behaviorist approach, another key modern approach when psychology is deemed a science. And essentially he's, he's interested in how the world can be understood by investigating external events that are observed and measured. And on the screen there you can see how he saw the mind as receptive and passive with these two fountains of knowledge in sensation and reflection. Not only can the self perceive the outside world, it can also perceive itself. Still certainly uh, psychology as a philosophy at the moment. This is where I suppose we start to, to see the sort of the first signs of perhaps the, the future of psychology as a science. And this is Charles Darwin. Um, so you've probably came across this uh, in, in biology, but essentially Charles Darwin proposed the evolutionary theory. And it's the notion that all humans and animal behavior has changed over successive generations. Um, so that the individuals with stronger, more adaptive genes survive and reproduce um, and the individuals with weaker genes do not survive and reproduce okay so the weaker genes are almost weeded out and that's that concept of survival of the fittest Wilhelm Wundt certainly worked in this school of functionalism um, and essentially it in short functionalism or sort of the school of functionalism focuses on individuals and, and human behavior um, and focusing on its utility and focusing on the adaption of human behavior to the environment. Okay, and Darwin and, and his work and, and Darwinian thinking leads us nicely to, to part two, if you like of the emergence of psychology as a science. And these are the key modern approaches, okay? So in, in the specification, the AQA specification, they suggest that there's five main approaches and this is sort of widely accepted in psychology. But it's important to note sort of the, the differences between the modern approaches, sort of the main modern approaches, but also importantly, the origins of these approaches. Um, and that's nicely uh, shown by these two figures uh, on your screen here. On your left you have Wilhelm Wundt and that's where our focus um, of the specification lies. Uh, so we'll be spending a bit of time uh, on him. Also on the right is William James. Um, and they, those two essentially extended the work of Darwin um, and Darwinian thinking and worked within that school of structuralism that I just mentioned and also introduce this idea of reductionism. Okay, so sticking to, to the focus of Wundt then, and continuing this school of thought of structuralism, 
because psychology is now a science, structuralism goes a bit further, remembering that psychology is interested in the mind, okay, and behaviour. Structuralism now means that the idea that an experience is analysed in terms of its components or parts, okay, so the structure can be broken down. Um, for example, the idea, or particularly the idea, that consciousness can be split into thoughts, images, and sensations. And in doing so, that's, that's really where he, he got dubbed the, the title of father of psychology, because this is really where, in his actions, he moved psychology from philosophy to a controlled, and we'll sort of get on to what that means, a controlled scientific psychological research discipline. And he did so, it's a nice key bit of information to know, um, he did so by setting up the first psychology laboratory at the University of Leipzig in Germany, okay, the Institute of Experimental Psychology, with the focus on consciousness. As one was working in this, this school of structuralism, or this idea of structuralism, the main method he used was this groundbreaking method known as introspection. And now you might have came across this term before to, to introspect on something or, or introspection generally. Um, and it's quite nicely summed up with that photo there. Anecdotally, introspection, colloquially, you know, it's, it's kind of looking within, okay? It's sort of turning in and reflecting upon yourself. However, because this is scientific now, and psychology isn't merely a philosophy, scientifically introspection is a controlled and systematic, systematic analysis okay, of your own conscious experience of a stimulus done by investigating internal events by examining conscious thoughts and feelings. Okay, so you should have that on your screen now. So it's the scientific examination, someone's conscious with the focus on the mental functions, thinking about this school of structuralism, but particularly at this time, Wundt was interested with his technique of introspection in those three mental functions, thoughts, images, and sensations. And the two principles of introspection is that Behaviour is seen as being caused or determined and it is possible, because of behaviour being able to be determined, it is possible to predict how human beings would behave in different, different conditions and therefore it is predictable. Okay, so the way that Wilhelm Wundt went about researching the uh, human mind and consciousness through introspection was asking subjects and in this case it would actually be his colleagues okay so his researchers at the university to focus on an everyday object and look inwards noticing sensations feelings and images so to evaluate once introspection hopefully you can see on your screen quite a few evaluation points both strengths and limitations and there's quite a few, okay? It's quite easy because in, in the broad spectrum of the emergence of psychology as a science to go straight to the limitations. But it's important to, to think of the strengths first because this is really the first notable sign of uh, the study of the mind being scientific. So to start with, you've got the controlled conditions and external var variables, okay, or extraneous variables. This is really important when trying to infer a cause and effect. So when presented with something, in this case a stimulus, whatever it was, you could confidently, as a researcher, infer that it was because of that stimulus alone that that is why that person experienced that sensation or that feeling or that thought. So you could just picture the lab environment. Because you've not got all these things going on around you, 
say for example you've just got the researcher or the subject rather sitting in front of uh, the stimulus whatever that might be and a metronome going with wouldn't for example uh, making sure this was all going in a controlled fashion the conditions were controlled and therefore it could be implied that whatever that subject was experiencing um, or, or any of the mental processes going on that they, that they reported was because of that stimulus. So that's sort of the first thing that's quite nice about introspection. Secondly, it's a systematic examination of trained subjects which produces valuable insights to how the mind and how human consciousness works. Because he asked his colleagues who were perhaps fellow doctoral students um, or, or rather his supervised doctoral students or it was postdoctoral colleagues at the university, these weren't just sort of uh, inexperienced people that were just reflecting, that were just you know casually introspection, in, introspecting these were trained subjects, okay? So they knew what they were doing, and that's a really important point to make, that, that it was really producing valuable insights into human consciousness. Third is that the stimuli and the research procedure was standardized, really important point. So they're all shown the same stimulus, whatever that might be, in the same conditions and the same environment, and that was repeated. And lastly, introspection is a point of feasibility. Is that It's still used in, in modern psychological research because of its, um, its use of people's own experience and it's a highly acceptable, highly feasible, you know, you can do it. But, you know, it, it doesn't really cost anything too much, okay? Perhaps the, the training of the subjects and the, and the lab environment um, but aside from that, it's, it's still used today. Going on to, to the limitations of introspection, and these perhaps flow a little bit easier um, because of the time that this was done, but very important to remember those strengths. But the limitations are, is that the responses, what the data interpreted, were different by the subjects and the researchers. Okay, so the idea the cause and effect could be established when presented with a certain stimuli. Say, for example, X produces Y, or shown a picture of this would make someone feel this way. That could not be concluded, okay? Because all the responses were different. All the data collected was interpreted differently by the subjects and the researchers. Also, the responses of introspection were non-observable responses. In other words, they were subjective in their nature, okay? Thinking that it was internal reflection done by, okay, albeit a trained subject, it was still something that was observed by themselves, which makes it subjective. It wasn't observed by someone else, and... Subjectivity is something that science has a problem with and psychology has a problem with and largely because of the bias involved. Probably the most easiest limitation point to make about introspection is how it's a naive data collection. Essentially what introspection is, if you want to break it down, is it's a self-reflection on internal processes. That's it. But a nice way to to describe or make that point of, well, that's it, is to call it a naive data collection method. And a fourth point you can, you can make about a limitation for introspection is validity. Validity, in this case, uh, introspection, refers to how well this introspection technique measures what it was created to measure, which is internal processes. And the reason why it has poor validity as, as a research method, as a scientific research method, is because it's known that a lot of these internal processes, such as thoughts, are subconscious. 
they're not conscious. This means that introspection, being, albeit a, a naive data collection, a self-reflection of internal processes, doesn't actually cover, doesn't actually record or measure these processes. So that is once introspection covered and evaluated. So going on to the next key figure in the emergence of psychology as a science going in chronological order is Sigmund Freud and the psychodynamic approach. So the first key major modern approach in psychology as a science. We briefly mentioned the, the subconscious or the unconscious and how introspection couldn't cover such a thing. And this is really the main focus of the psychodynamic approach and Freud's work. In the early 1900s, Freud proposed his psychoanalytic theory, which is one of the many theories that comes under the umbrella of psychodynamic psychology or psychodynamic approach. And his theory focused on conscious versus unconscious conflicts of the mind with a huge focus on this unconscious referring to he called them sort of drives and motivations essentially these things that are well we're not aware of um, but they're actually playing a huge role in our behavior and what we think and what we do and what we feel. He proposed also the tripart personality theory, which split up our personality into these three characters, if you like, the ego, superego, and id. And he proposed, or he found, he was a, um, what he was, was a therapist really. And, and what he found with his patients and, and the work he did with them was that mental illnesses, psychosis, hysteria, all these things materialized due to this personality structure. It was when the ego wasn't in control and the three were almost unbalanced in a sense, which meant that, that the unconscious which mainly um, existed in the id and the superego, uh, was controlling our consciousness and what we thought, and ultimately how we behaved. The main technique that he, he used to fix this, if you like, or to solve this problem was psychoanalytic therapy. So there's a series of techniques that fall under this umbrella, um, which includes the interpretation of dreams, free association, parapraxis. And this was to help people with mental illnesses that were presented to him, his clients, uh, distor disorders, um, hysteria. That was really his focus. And we'll get onto this when we cover the psychodynamic approach. Um, but a key part of this, of psychoanalytic therapy, was um, trying to resolve conflicts of the mind and a key part of this was uncovering repressed memories about your childhood um, so that's kind of where this sort of tell me about your childhood is associated with Freud because he thought that um, what well, he proposed another theory called the psychosexual stages of personality development and he proposed how almost um, if we became fixated on one of these stages it would result into being unsatisfied or having mental illness materialize in adult life. So the next key figure is Ivan Pavlov and we're going on to a new approach and that is the behaviorist approach which falls under the umbrella for the specification as one of the learning approaches. So behaviorism focused on learning by association, which is a nice way to think about what classical conditioning is. And that was done by 
or famously uh, demonstrated through Pavlov's dogs. And it's essentially the idea that both humans and animals can be classically conditioned. Um, and this is essentially where they make an association between a neutral stimulus and a natural reflex response to make that stimulus conditioned. So famously in Pavlov's dogs, there was the sound of a bell, and this bell didn't produce any reflex, any response from dogs. It was just the sound of a bell, didn't mean anything. It was neutral. However, when dogs were presented with food, they would start to salivate. And what he did, almost by accident, was he paired this neutral stimulus and this natural reflex response to the, sti uh, to the food. So he paired the sound of the bell with the food. And during this association, it produced afterwards just the bell alone producing the same response as to what the food does with dogs. Okay, so when he took the food away from the bell, after associating the two, just the mere sound of the bell produced the dogs to salivate. The next key figure in the behaviorist approach was B.F. Skinner, his idea of operant conditioning. So still on the idea of conditioning, but rather operant instead of classical like Pavlov or Pavlovian conditioning. And this type of conditioning was learning by consequence. So he continued the idea of behaviorism and he felt that the main goal of psychology or the focus should be on the prediction and control of behavior. Within this, he proposed his stimulus response theory. Essentially, we respond to stimuli with our behavior, not thoughts. Um, but importantly in this idea, if our behavior produces rewarding consequences, we will do it again, and this is this idea of, of reinforcement. The key study that he used to demonstrate this was Skinner's box for rats, or Skinner's box generally, um, because he used a wide uh, variety of animals. And importantly in this idea of operant conditioning is that the response can be positive and negative, okay? Or the consequence, rather, can be positive and negative. Continuing with the, the learning approaches, that shouldn't say behaviorist approach, that should say learning approaches, is this next key sort of part of the learning approaches and that's social learning theory. And the main key person with social learning theory is Albert Bandura. And his idea that he proposed in this theory was that behavior, still with that focus on behavior, is learned from observing the environment or people and the reinforcement or punishment they receive. So this covers imitation, which is essentially uh, copying behavior, modeling, and this idea of the role model. Um, so having someone that you can see do the behavior and then imitate it or copy it yourself. And this idea of vicarious reinforcement, which is a key part in why we model behavior and why we imitate it. And it's not so much that we get reinforced or we get uh, positive praise or whatever, or reward, but we see other people do it. We observe the environment and we observe people getting this reinforcement. That's what makes it vicarious. So um, it's important to note that social learning theory doesn't just focus on behavior, it also consider, considers rather cognitive processes and it kind of is the first signs of the cognitive approach almost in a revised um, attempt at his, his first key theory of social learning theory and social cognitive theory and that accepts how there are also cognitive processes involved in behavior and the key study that Bandera, sorry, Bandura used was the Bobo doll study, 
or the Bobo doll experiments, actually. And, and in these experiments, the idea was the, he explored aggression and he demonstrated in this study how children, when they observed an adult being aggressive towards a Bobo doll, which is essentially um, this sort of inflatable doll that kind of sort of bounces back when you, when you hit it, or when you play with it, it kind of sort of pops back up again. That when children were exposed to, to this, they were imitating it. Um, so they were modeling the adult being aggressive with the doll. And when children were shown, were not shown this, they weren't aggressive. When children were not shown aggressive behaviors towards the doll, they didn't imitate aggressive behaviors towards the doll. Moving on to Abraham Maslow and the humanistic approach now, which is where it sort of changes up. And instead of observable events and experiences being the, the scientific focus um, and study of psychology, the, the focus was on subjective experiences, okay? And Maslow was concerned with describing the inner life and experience of individuals rather than what the behaviorists were, were focused on in predicting and developing theories for changing behavior. Maslow was interested in those, those concepts of free will, self-actualization, and individuality. His key theory was the theory of human mo motivation, also known as the hierarchy of needs, which suggested that in order to self-actualize, certain need categories needed to be fulfilled in order to achieve self-actualization. The other key figure in the humanistic approach was Carl Rogers, and he focused on this idea of congruence, uh, which is the idea that the real self and the self-concept of an individual are aligned. And he, he thought that when these two are aligned, the, the person could then live a happy and fulfilled life. And in doing so, he continued this idea of, of subjective experience was important and he thought that was rather actually true. So priority was given to what a person understands to be true. In doing so, he developed this client-centered approach to therapy, this client-centered technique, um, also known as Rogerian therapy. And one of the key techniques that you might have heard of before uh, included in this approach to therapy was active listening. But importantly in this technique was this element of an unconditional positive regard. The an emphasis on a positive relationship was key for someone to live a fulfilled and happy life. Moving on to the cognitive approach and a key figure in this approach is Elizabeth Loftus. So the cognitive approach viewed the mind almost as a computer or viewed it as an information processor and was concerned with how essentially we take as humans stimulus from our environment and how we process that to produce behaviors. Important to Loftus work is, is some of the things on the slide there and the idea that original memory can be modified. In other words, it means that it can be false and this has a huge implication in eyewitness testimony because subsequent information can affect an eyewitness's account of an event. The last key approach is the biological approach. This approach sees behavior as rooted in the physiology and biology of the body and it examines the processes that occur and looks for how that may affect 
the individual and their behavior and their thoughts. This key idea focused on the nervous system, which is the mind, not just as the brain, but the whole body, and the endocrine system. And they did this by using highly controlled and objective methods, such as brain scanning techniques, such as EEG. A key point to, to make on this approach was this idea of localization and how specific behaviors can be linked to specific brain areas or patterns of neural activity. So this is just an example of electroencephalogram or an EEG. And as you can see there, you can see the brain waves um, are related to, so they use this EEG net and it produces these brain waves that have been associated with certain states of the mind. So you've got the gamma waves um, and they've been associated with problem solving, uh, better, um, associated with busy tasks, alpha is respectful and restful, theta is almost drowsiness and delta waves are associated with sleep and dreaming. And really that's where this sort of presentation finishes on the main approaches and we're going to be focusing on all these major approaches over this module.